June is the biggest month of the year when it comes to gaming news, and we've got a ton of things to talk about in today's episode, so with this in mind, we are going to be doing the sponsor first. Not too long ago, I decided I was too happy with my own life, so I decided to play some Valorant. Not playing for nearly a year, it took me around 35 minutes of guessing my password and remembering my recovery questions before I could actually jump into the game. At the time, I remember thinking to myself that surely science had come up with a solution to this problem, and as it turned out, it had. NordPass lets users save and secure every single password they ever make. Set them all to impossible to guess messes of letters and numbers, then gives you access to all of them, behind one single master pass. If you're a lazy degenerate like myself, you're probably already thinking that setting this up sounds like too much work, but NordPass will just take all your already saved passwords from your current browser, meaning you barely have to lift a finger. What this means is that you'll always have impossibly difficult passwords to guess, your passwords will autofill wherever you go, and they'll all be synced on all your devices. Perhaps the best part of all is that NordPass is disgustingly cheap. So much in fact, that even a person living in abject poverty could afford a subscription, and by using the code on screen, or by clicking on a link in the description, you'll get a 70% discount, and an entire month for free. NordPass, the laziest way to protect your shit. June kicked off with a new PlayStation State of Play, and it certainly didn't disappoint. The showcase, which was watched more than any of Sony's past E3 conferences, showed off the long-awaited Final Fantasy 16, which was confirmed to be releasing on the PS5 in the middle of next year. Sony then kept the combo going with its Street Fighter 6 presentation, which not only looked incredible, but was confirmed to be coming to every single platform under the sun, excluding of course the Switch. Sticking with Capcom, a Resident Evil 4 remake was confirmed to be in the works, which will be dropping in March of next year, while it would also be announced that the entire campaign for Resident Evil Village would be getting full PSVR to support. Sony's yet to be released VR headset would also be home to the likes of both No Man's Sky and a Horizon offshoot named Horizon Call of the Mountain, which will be a PSVR exclusive. One of the biggest announcements came when the long-awaited Callisto Protocol received a gameplay trailer, so viewers who are in the mood to shit themselves can wait for this to drop in December this year. Other notable announcements include Spider-Man Remastered and Spider-Man Miles Morales coming to PC on the 12th of August. Viewers who wish to see my review of the game from when it came out a million years ago are free to watch that in their own time. Meanwhile, God of War Ragnarok is rumored to release in November this year. Battlefield 2042 launches its first season of content after 7 months, and both Cyberpunk and Dragon Age are getting an animated Netflix series. Although we didn't have E3 this year, the Summer Games Fest was a very worthy substitution. Due to the sheer fucking volume of announcements, we are going to be going full rap god for this entire segment. So let's get started. Guile was announced for Street Fighter 6. A multiplayer game set in The Last of Us world is in development and will contain a story as big as other Naughty Dog games. The Callisto Protocol aired extended gameplay. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 showcased gameplay in the game's new campaign, which also highlighted the return of both Ghost and Soap McTavish. Marvel's Midnight Suns revealed Spider-Man and a release date of October 7th. Gotham Knights showed off Nightwing gameplay. The Saints Row remake received a boss factory where you can create your custom character for the game before its release in August this year. Humankind will be releasing on consoles on November 4th. The Last of Us HBO series revealed a few shots from the upcoming show, which Fire showcased a new gameplay trailer and an early access announcement. A sci-fi thriller called Ford Solace will be featuring voice acting from the likes of Troy Baker and Roger Clark. Frost Giant, a studio created by ex-Blizzard staff, revealed their new RTS game, called Stormgate. Goat Simulator 3 received an announcement trailer. 
Ripping off Dead Island 2, Warhammer 40k Darktide, received an extended gameplay trailer. An action-adventure title named High Water will let you experience a world ruined by climate change. One Piece Odyssey received a story trailer. The survival game, Nightingale, received an extended gameplay trailer. Warframe will be receiving a new open-world expansion called the Doovery Paradox. And lastly, The Last of Us 1, a 9-year-old game will be receiving a complete remake, which will be releasing on September 2nd, with a PC version, to follow at a later date. Contrary to popular belief, when I first named this series news without the bullshit, this was the kind of thing I had in mind. Next up we have the Microsoft conference, what many believe to be the best of the month, but before we jump into Starfield, let's cover everything else that went down. Time for another lightning round. Round 2. Fight. The recently delayed Dreadfall kicked off this year's show, featuring a gameplay reveal of the four playable characters. The release date is still broadly set to sometime next year. Hollow Knight Silksong was announced to be a day one release on Game Pass. Squanch Games, a development studio helmed by the creators of Rick and Morty, revealed their new FPS, which features voice acting from Justin Roiland, and seems ridiculous enough to be ripped straight out of a Rick and Morty storyboard. A Plague Tale Requiem received an extended gameplay trailer. Microsoft Flight Simulator revealed their 40th anniversary plans by announcing additional aircraft such as gliders and helicopters, and even dropped the Pelican from Halo Infinite as a fully functioning aircraft. The next Forza Motorsport was shown off with a gameplay trailer featuring ray tracing and realistic damage. Forza Horizon 5 also received its first major DLC expansion, which will be all about Hot Wheels and will be available this July. Fallout 76 will receive an expansion called The Pit, which will be available this September. Arc 2 received another trailer featuring Vin Diesel and will be a day one release on Game Pass when it comes out sometime in 2023. Upcoming survival game Scorn received its first gameplay trailer and will be releasing day one on Game Pass. On October 21st, Mojang's newest project. Minecraft Legends will release day one on Game Pass and will be an action strategy game. Hideo Kojima is partnering with Xbox to create an exclusive title. Nothing is currently known about the project at this time. Obsidian announced their new game called Pentiment, which is a crime drama set in 16th century Germany. Grounded will finally be receiving its full release this September. After two years of early access, Team Ninja announced their next game titled Wo Long, Fallen Dynasty, which will take place during the Three Kingdoms period of China and will release day one on Game Pass early next year. Finally, three of the Persona games are also headed to Game Pass, including Persona 3 Portable, Persona 4 Golden, and Persona 5 Royal. With those out of the way, let's get to the heavy hitters. Microsoft would announce yet another huge addition to Game Pass with League of Legends, Valorant, Wild Rift, Legends of Rune Terror, and Team Fight Tactics, all joining the subscription service. As you may have noticed, these are all free games, but their addition on Game Pass all come with insane perks, most notable of which is that League of Legends and Valorant players now get all playable characters unlocked for free. For context, in League of Legends alone, unlocking all playable champions would usually cost around 650 freedom bucks, or 7 full lifetimes of grinding. Players who are looking to get into either game might want to hold off for the time being, as they'll be much better off when these titles come to Game Pass at either the end of 2022 or the start of next year. Perhaps the biggest reveal of the event was the showcase dedicated to Starfield, Bethesda's next AAA title, and the first game they'll be releasing since being acquired by Microsoft. The 15-minute presentation included exploration, mining, and the studio's take on what lockpicking might look like in the future. Spaceflight and combat were also featured within the presentation, along with perhaps the game's most impressive addition, complete ship customization. might have flap and the rich lady under your spell, but it's gonna take more than that to impress me. Players will have the option to add modules that improve speed, 
cargo space, mobility, jump range, shields, and even crew capacity, and the level of customization, in terms of how a person can lay out their ship, honestly looks fucking bonkers. Character customization was also shown off briefly, which was said to be more detailed than anything that came before, and even lets players choose their own character background. For example, a combat medic might be able to heal themselves for slightly more, and have a larger carrying capacity, while a diplomat can negotiate for better prices, while having a better chance at passing speech checks. Traits were also included within the presentation, which are optional perks that come with downsides. For example, an introverted player will have more endurance while alone, but less while with other human companions. There's even a trait which lets the player start with their own small house, but comes at a cost of a 50,000 credit mortgage that they'll be required to repay over their playthrough. The presentation also showed off some of the combat, which seemed to be its weakest link at the moment, with the frame rate in particular, looking worrying to say the least. However, with likely a year before it actually launches, there's still plenty of time to smooth out much of these optimization issues. At the tail end of the presentation, it was also mentioned that Starfield will have over a thousand fully explorable planets, and although it initially sounded as if they may have spread themselves too thin, it seems as if this was done very specifically for the modding community. Bethesda titles have always had a huge modding scene in the past, and it appears as if their commitment to put a thousand mostly empty planets in the game is a conscious decision to let modders organize and work with their own planets without fear that their projects will overlap with each other. Starfield is still a while from being released, but we'll be sure to keep everyone up to date with more news until it releases on Game Pass sometime next year. Meanwhile, the Final Fantasy VII Remake is going to be a trilogy, with the second part coming in early next year. Call of Duty has stricter gun control than Texas, and Fallout 5 was confirmed to be releasing after The Elder Scrolls 6, so likely in another 13 years. For better or worse, Activision Blizzard also got their own segment this month, but before we hit on some of the negative news, let's first start with the good shit. Overwatch 2 got what was perhaps its biggest month of news in years, when it was announced that not only would it be free to play, and not only would it be fully cross-platform, but we even got a release date of October 4th. Unsurprisingly, the monetization model seems to be shifting away from loot boxes and onto a new battle pass system, which when considering the generous approach to loot boxes in Overwatch 1, seems to be a reasonable course of action. The game will operate through seasons lasting 9 weeks at a time, and bring with them, new skins, heroes, maps, and game modes, as well as the PvE mode, which will come out sometime next year, for an additional fee. The team also confirmed a new skin rarity above Legendary, which will see players able to customize their skins, however, it's not currently certain how players will gain access to these items. In terms of hero releases, the team is aiming to have one hero from each role released on launch, but is committed to having another out before the end of the year. The team also mentioned that support heroes will make up three of the two post-launch heroes they've currently got planned, and that they want to make more supports which reward a more game sense style of gameplay. It's been just short of 1200 days since Overwatch has gotten itself a support character, and as a fellow support player myself, I couldn't be happier. Also announced was Junker Queen, the Australian mummy tank, which by the time this video comes out, will be playable in the game's latest beta. Junker Queen is equipped with a shotgun, an axe, a throwable knife which can pull enemies to her position, a shout ability which beefs up her teammates speed and health, and an ultimate, which can apply anti-heals on enemies. She also has a passive, where all bladed attacks apply bleed to the enemy, and all bleed damage dealt, restores her own health. Another hero that was teased, but not yet available to play, was an unannounced support hero, which seemed to be the pet character, which was rumored to be in development as early as 2019. The Overwatch beta is currently running for the next 3 weeks, so viewers in the Australian region should expect to see me on those 10 second support queue times throughout the test. We now move on to some not so good news, with the release of Diablo Immortal. 
the free-to-play game available on PC and mobile, initially received high praise from critics during its review window earlier in the year. However, when the full version launched and microtransactions were turned on, players began doing some quick math. Smarter people than ourselves began to realize that to max out a single character completely, players would be required to either play the game for around 10 whole years, or put in anywhere between 50 to $110,000. And no, that's not a mistake. One streamer in particular put a whole $16,000 into the game and didn't get a single legendary gem, which really takes scummy monetization models to whole new lows. As you might imagine, a game which was so well received, before it was objectively ruined with microtransactions, was almost immediately review bombed to devastating effect, as it quickly became the most disliked Metacritic game of all time. The game's monetization model also made it illegal to sell in Belgium and the Netherlands, while the game's delayed release in China caused NetEase stocks to drop nearly 10%. Now that's a lot of damage! The situation was made worse when looking back on the development of the title, when earlier this year, the lead developer assured players that there would be no way to either buy gear or level up by directly paying money. Of course, you could argue that gems wouldn't technically count as gear, but this would be quite misleading at best and a straight up lie at worst. As of time of writing, no public announcement has been made to address this criticism, while the company would alternatively announce that the game generated a whole $24 million in the first two weeks of release. We can only hope that when Microsoft's acquisition goes through, this kind of absolute bullshit will be too damaging for the company to tolerate. If this shit was bad, then gee fucking whiz, it was about to get worse. After years worth of sexual harassment claims, leading up to one employee fucking killing herself, the company finally concluded its internal investigation on the matter and announced that there was no wrongdoing within the organization. If there was ever a better opportunity to use that picture of Obama giving himself a medal, now would be the time. A few days after the investigation had concluded, it was announced that CEO of the company and contender for the biggest piece of shit in America, Bobby Kotick, would be re-elected to the board of directors for another year. Viewers might remember him as the guy who threatened to kill his assistant over a voicemail, stepped in to help a person who committed sexual abuse keep their job and get paid 400 million for eventually selling the company to Microsoft when he ran its reputation firmly into the ground. This truly is a clown world. It should be noted that as the acquisition hasn't yet been completed, the decision to keep Mr. Kotick was entirely out of the hands of Microsoft, and many expect that if he doesn't resign by the handover date, he'll be getting thrown out the second Phil Spencer gets his hands on the keys. In terms of new releases, June saw the launch of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, Diablo Immortal, The Quarry, Sonic Origins, the High Isle expansion for the Elder Scrolls Online, and Cuphead, the delicious last course. July is set for the slowest month of game releases this year, including F122, the Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels DLC, and Stray. With this huge month of news finally over, we'd like to thank everyone for sticking around till the end, and viewers who might be interested in news from all around the world, can be sure to hit the bell icon, for when our regular news goes live at the end of this month. Roll the fucking outro.